What is up, everybody? Welcome to episode 59 of Sales Stories in Real Life. I'm your host, Alex Bruski, and this is the show where professional salespeople share their stories about memorable buying experiences. Today, we've got a very good friend of the show on, very special guest. He is currently a sales enablement professional uh, at a stealth startup, supporting AEs through onboarding in their first 90 days. He is a content creator and course creator of the course Story Selling, which helps AEs to build confidence and prepare themselves for their next interviews, supports those that are trying to break into tech, and teaches them self-esteem as a service. Welcome to the show, Mr. Blake Hudson. I, uh, I'm really excited for this one because this is a new topic that we're diving into today. I heard that you had a really interesting experience when you were part of a buying committee, um, T- TBD on the results of, mm-hmm. of the buying process. What, uh, what happened there, Blake? Yeah. First of all, thank you for having me. This is uh it's funny that we're on sales stories in real life. It took us a while before we met in real life, but uh, once we did, the magic has happened and uh, we've been really strong connected ever since. Um, so yeah, my buying story was interesting. I think that we're going to take a slightly different approach here than previous guests. I was more of the internal champion in my buying process. Um, so for context here, I had just started as a sales manager for a group of SDRs. I was responsible for building the entire outbound function, um, taking us from basically zero ARR to roughly 1.5 million a, a month in ARR. So we scaled that team 6X ARR, we scaled it 3X headcount and um, built a really strong culture to go along with it. That was not by accident. Uh, it was a lot of intention in terms of who to hire, uh, 360 learning, you know, supporting one another, especially as we pioneered success. So all of that is important context because while I was trying to manage this growing team of ultimately 15 reps, I was trying to build, um, how do I put this, a foundation for that culture and just really have something tangible in place because it felt like the things that were really supporting us and helping us succeed were a little intangible, right? A little hard to to touch and feel. And I thought that uh, a gamification software that could help with our coaching, our activity efforts could really support the team and give them that extra bit of boost to see. We've already been trying to get better. We've already been trying to support one another outdo our former selves, outdo the previous month and quarter. But it was just difficult because we didn't quite have the the clarity, so to speak, in terms of how that was going about. So there is a context. Now, I was not the decision maker for this process. I had mentioned the software that I wanted as early as my job interview. That's how committed I was to this software. And more than just the software and the company, uh, and I'll I'll leave them out of it, but it was really what I was just talking about is how do I go about building a sustainable culture that's heavily focused on coaching and supporting reps one-on-one. And it just felt like it continued to get pushed by the wayside. And I didn't even end up having a conversation with an account executive over at that team until probably two or three months into my tenure. I had some other priorities to take care of first, hiring, building out the team. We went from five to 11 reps and like immediately it felt like. Um, so there were some foundational things that needed to be done there. But it, I felt like it was a huge priority for me. And I would kind of continue to bring this to my VP and my decision makers. And in hindsight, I was getting, you know, kind of the lip service of like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll check that out. That's important. We'll, we'll make that a priority. Or my favorite was I'd get asked, like, what do you need? You, you guys are succeeding. You're, you're really thriving. What do you need to maintain the success? And I'm like, I need this software to help me with coaching, to help with our activity metrics and make sure that we're not just doing the work, but we're actually enjoying it too. I think that you can do both. It's possible. Right. And so it just kept getting pushed, pushed. And then eventually I met with the account executive and hit it off. Great. I mean, 
she knew exactly why I was interested in the software. I was getting all the information I needed from her. And one of the things I want to commend her with was that she was excellent at, we'll call her Julie. Julie was excellent at equipping me with the information I needed to advocate for this, this purchase, right? This software. Right. Unfortunately though, I was not ultimately that decision maker. And so the next step where we kind of left, it was always trying to get a meeting on the books. And in hindsight, it feels like, man, why didn't I just use one of my one-on-ones for that meeting? And I've looked back over my text messages because I still have those texts from, from, you know, a bygone era. And we tried that. We, we tried multiple times and it just kept getting pushed, kept getting missed. And I'll be honest with you, to this day, I still kind of rack my brain thinking, what exactly could that A have done differently to make that process, that transaction happen? And I think that's, you know, kind of where our conversation can go today is just thinking through that, like, practically speaking, what more could she have done? I know trials or something like that would have helped, but that was just kind of difficult to set up. Our RevOps team was also onboarding a lot of other tools, um, data insights, data providers. So it wasn't like we didn't have other things going on. It just felt like, you know, you have a manager advocating for this, for his team with intention, and it just kind of keeps getting pushed by the wayside. Uh, so yeah, that that's the, the brunt of the story. Happy to take it wherever the conversation goes, but... Um, you need more than just an internal champion to make the the buyer to make that purchase happen. Yeah, this is when you told me about this idea, uh, I was really excited about it right away because number one, this isn't really a topic that we have dove into before mm -hmm. on the show. Um, but also most of the selling experiences on the show and then sale, right? It's, it's sales stories in real life, but like we want to, we, we want to show the full story, right? Like we want to show both sides of the coin. And I think this is a phenomenal opportunity to do that. And I think you already kind of rhetorically asked yourself the million dollar question that we're going to get to, which is, you know, what could this AE have done, even if say you were in their shoes, but let's maybe even back it up a little bit further, because I think something like building a champion and building a business case is something that a lot of sellers, I know at least me earlier in my career, kind of look at as a checkbox item, right? Like Julie could be like, well, I've got a champion that's selling for me, right? Like let's, let's check the box, you know, and now move on and try and, you know, get the meeting with the other person. So that, that, that kind of gets a lot of ideas going through your head. And it's a really fascinating spot for you because you're trying to push this software forward to help your team continue to grow. And like you even said, your own words, build a foundation for the team to continue building on. You had this great culture, headcount exploded, ARR is exploding. Mm -hmm. And now like you're teaching your reps to sell while you're trying to buy internally. Right. Sure. So it's, it's a real, it's a really interesting dynamic there. <clears throat> so tell me a little bit about, obviously you mentioned you were talking about the software even before you started. Right. Mm -hmm. So like many buyers, you made it to Julie and you were already 30, 40, 50% through the buying process. Right. You, you knew that you wanted it. You knew that there was value there. You didn't need to be sold, but like the rest of your team had to be sold. So tell us from the perspective of say a buyer that has an internal champion and perhaps that internal champion isn't necessarily like the decision maker, so to speak, right? Like what's your life like, right? Like, are you just advocating this in for this in your meetings or, you know, you doing, uh, you know, ROI analyses, right? Like, like, what does it look like to be an internal champion trying to get something done? Yeah, it really felt like I was trying to coordinate things for the account executive. I was trying to set them up to showcase the software. And I had already kind of set context for what the implications could be of having it. One of the first hurdles was just figuring out who to get in the room. We did actually get a demo. And it was with um, a couple of our RevOps uh, directors. So we had one for the AEs, one for the SDRs. That was another challenge of, was this going to be a tool just for SDRs or was this going to be a tool across the go-to-market function? So like, I took it upon myself to try and coordinate some of these things because I didn't want to add work to someone's plate. Um, it was just a matter of understanding like, 
who all needs to be a part of this decision making process. Now, I know most account executives go through that process, but this just happened to be expedited for her. So that's something that if you if you haven't caught my tone with this, it's a very frustrating story. I I mean, the outcome was not necessarily what I wanted and the process definitely left a lot to be desired. I do commend the AE. I don't think that there was anything wrong on their end. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to give the context. If I start to feel a little sound a little in my feelings, it's probably because I am still in my feelings. But uh, yeah, I just, I think being able to navigate that buyer journey, being able to pull the right stakeholders in was like my first priority. So let, let's go back to that demo because I was actually going to ask you, did, did it ever make it to a demo? Um, and then maybe I'll ask a caveat question. Did did the decision maker ever make it into a demo or was it just the RevOps people? So that'll be like question part one. Question part two, like what happened on this demo, right? Was there buy-in from your RevOps people to your point? Like was there confusion around, is this an SDR tool? Is this a go-to-market tool, right? So like what's what what's happening inside of that demo? Like what, like what, was it a typical demo, right? What were some of the standouts there? I think it was a typical demo. And I think there was an understanding that this could be a tool utilized across go-to-market. So we kind of started broad in that way. And there was a couple of managers our enablement uh, person and the rev op leaders. And we were just trying to understand like, who is it for? What will it look like for the rev ops team to implement and, you know, just kind of onboard this tool in the context of everything else they were doing. Right. And um, yeah, just really understanding like what the outcome would be. And I think that's where maybe the disconnect happened because the, the importance was felt by the decision maker. And that's because I kind of had my thumb on that pain point, right? right? But the urgency was never there. And so it makes you start to wonder, is it a nice to have or a need to have? And I, in a really odd way, I think our success hurt us because I was able to continue to thrive despite not having this tool. And it was just kind of like, what do you need it for? if this is working and yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm speculating that was never said to me, but it makes me wonder if that's what, you know, might've been happening there. And to your second question, uh, the decision maker never did attend a demo, never did meet with the account executive, despite multiple attempts to set that up. There were last minute scratches. There was all sorts of um, maneuvering to, to not make that happen. Well, let me also acknowledge very much appreciate you kind of reliving this mm -hmm. this frustrating experience. Um, I, I I know it's not easy to do, and obviously you're a very thoughtful person. Like you're someone who's extremely empathetic, so I know that this isn't necessarily the easiest exercise. So we very much appreciate you going through this to kind of extract some learnings because. I think we've all had that really frustrating deal before, whether it was like a champion wanted it and the decision maker didn't want it. Like we've all had those deals that make us feel like this. You, you were going to jump in with something there? Yeah, I just want to be very clear too that this frustration is not from the selfish standpoint. I was able to do my job and do it well. The frustration comes from what the team was missing out on. Um, you know, we had maybe one spiff in my tenure and that's just, I mean, I think borderline disrespectful. It just salespeople thrive on competition and to not create that healthy competition, I think is a miss. We had that, we had created healthy competition. There just weren't the structures in place to systematize that healthy competition, to make sure that it continued. And um, so my frustration lies with the lack of growth and support uh, fun that could have been had you know, from my team, that's, that's really where it comes from. It's not about me. That's, that that's a really good point of emphasis to bring on because like this whole time, the question that's just racking through my brain over and over again is like, what could Julie have done differently? Right? Like, that's like, I think what, like the whole, um, you know, the whole buildup of all this will become. And I mean, obviously there are a couple sort of red flags from the beginning, right? Is number one, to your point, your success actually hurt you. Right. Like, I think that's such a fascinating concept to wrap our heads around 
that like the the idea of loss aversion right like if the team was failing maybe this gets done if the team is doing awesome it doesn't get done um so that's kind of like a fascinating glimpse into like the psychology of being a human right is like yeah. when things are working well we're very much I don't want to say afraid of change, but reluctant to change. Cause like, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Um, and if something was broken, maybe it would have been a lot easier to say, Hey, let, let's do this because we have X, Y, Z that we want to improve on. So one of the questions that I'd have for you is, was the decision maker ever presented with like traditional, like ROI analyses or customer stories, right? Like some of those, uh, like social selling, you know, almost uh, type of points, or was it just like, just kind of going in with logic of like, hey, this could help us with X, Y, Z. Like, what what exactly did this decision maker take in essentially? Yes, to answer that question, and not only did they have that information, they had someone like me who was curating that information and really getting to the heart of it and being able to specifically apply it to our context. So it's like, this is what they've done for other companies. This is the sort of ROI teams have seen. And then I took it upon myself to personalize that to our situation and say, this is how this could improve our team. This is how you know we might be impacted by it based on what we've seen other companies do. So a lot of what I think conversation Julie would have had I was kind of preparing that conversation or serving as the introduction to it. Right. So there's no like wonder of like, oh, we should have, mm. you know, we should have sent that ROI analysis or like yeah. we should have, you know, sent that customer story. Like all, all of that was already thrown out. And I'm sure that's kind of a common thing that a lot of sellers are going to lean on to, uh, you know, sort of push things across. I, I think like what really becomes fascinating is the need to have versus the nice to have. And that kind of ties back to like the team's success, like hurting the chances of this deal for, for you specifically, what constitutes a need to have versus a nice to have? You can make the case that every piece of software is a nice to have personally. Now I know that you might take offense to that working at Salesforce because <laughs> That might be the ultimate need to have a CRM. Um, but even that, there's still, you know, workarounds, there's optionality there. So I I personally don't know if I have an answer to that, that difference. I think it really comes down to how you want to go about achieving your goals. Sometimes you have a piece of software that helps you get there more quickly. Sometimes you have a piece of software that gets you there in a more efficient way or more sustainable way in the long term. So it's really understanding what's the solution, the future state look like, and how do you best want to get there? I think that's what determines the need to have versus nice to have, in my humble opinion. Helpful, um, for sure. Um, and I like uh, I, I I like giving questions that stump people because that means that like yeah. hitting those uh, you know, we're that's we're right. hitting, hitting those deeper notes. Um, so what one one of the things that has to get asked, and and I'll I'll ask the grand question here in a second, but. If you were Julie, like obviously the thing that we haven't spoken about yet is multi-threading, right? And that's kind of the obvious one where it's like the decision maker never got to made it, make it into a demo. That is definitely going to be a big hurdle, right? Like if you've not kind of seen it in front of your own face and, you know, you don't get to put a name to the face of the account executive, the account executive can't like read your body language or overcome your objections on the spot, right? Like you're kind of stuck in that game of messenger. If you were Julie... How would you have tried to multi-thread the actual decision maker into the deal? Well, I mean, I don't think that uh, the, the decision maker needed to see the demo. Everyone on his team that he trusts saw the demo and was able to report back and say, this is helpful, this is good, it makes sense. Where I think the disconnect actually happened is the conversation that needed to take place with finance that even I wasn't necessarily privy to. So this was, you know, back when we were kind of going through that transition of like, everything was going great and then it wasn't. And we kind of hit a lull in the summertime, I think it was like 2022. So there was much more scrutiny on these different purchases. Um, you know, a question that could have been asked, I'm, I'm skipping ahead here, I know, but like, 
what sort of budget do you have, not for this software, but for your team? I think that's something that would have really made a lot of sense in terms of getting that information from, from me. And it's a question that I don't think I ever fully asked. So to have the AE asking that sort of question would have really helped clarify that. And then, yeah, to the finance point, like, what is the buying process look like at this company? Sometimes it's as simple as someone just signing off and saying, yep. Other times it's going to finance and, you know, either asking for permission or asking for, you know, or, or forgiveness, you know, depending on how that, you know, purchase actually goes about being made. Um, but yeah, that's finance's role in it was definitely a, a miss, a missed opportunity. I mean, this is a great point too, because this kind of starts to teeter into the point of like asking those really uncomfortable questions, right? Mm-hmm. Like folks that are early on in their sales career and even seasoned sales professionals, you know, it's not like, it's not the easiest question to ask, especially to someone who's championing this for you, mm-hmm. right? Like you have this sense of like, you want to keep things good, right? Like this is the person who's advocating for me. You know, I may not want to like ask them something uncomfortable, but I think you just brought up an awesome point there where like you almost didn't even consider this, right? Like you were almost kind of like, so in the mode of like advocating for this software, like you almost didn't even think to yourself, like what happens when I bring this to finance, right? Like you're trying to get the decision maker on board, but there's even like, in a sense, like a gatekeeper beyond the decision maker, right? Like actual finance. Um, So I think that's a really, really fascinating point. And just the importance of like knowing everything as an AE, right? Like who's my champion? How does stuff get bought? To your point, like, is it just the decision maker signs off? Is there procurement? Is there, right? Like, is there legal? How is the, how have these things gone in the past, right? Like has stuff been shot down in the past because it wasn't up to a certain standard. So I, I think that kind of leads all into the the sort of grand question, especially I'm fascinated to ask you this because you've been a sales manager, you're in sales enablement now, you, you very much teach people. Been a seller, I, been an I, account executive. Been a seller, you teach people how to choose confidence. You have, an, you have a course, right? To help people build confidence through the interviewing process. If you were Julie, what would you have done differently in hindsight, knowing what you know now? I would have gotten this question to the decision maker, and that is, what is the cost of inaction? Blake seems to think that the cost of inaction is a culture that starts to falter, one that has been built, is strong, seems to be self-sustaining, but eventually will hit a wall. And you'll see tangible impacts like loss of activity, attrition, but those are going to be things that come from this invisible loss of culture. So my question becomes, what is the cost of doing nothing? I would have sent that question via carrier pigeon. I would have texted it to him, however it needed to get on his desk. That's the question I would have asked. And uh, I would have used me as a conduit to that if need be. But there was this, um, again, just lack of urgency on our end that, um, a frustrated me considering how long I had been championing for it, but more importantly, B was stalling the deal. Um, I do want to talk about something though, before I forget, and we can expound on it later, but, um, I was kind of a unique buyer in that I am a content creator. This is a software that is purchased by sales leaders. Um, I think there was an opportunity there to have some sort of partnership And worst case scenario, like this deal got lost, but there is an opportunity to help this account executive win other deals. Um, Another missed opportunity, but that's, this is above my pay grade. Well, I like that a lot because that's very much how I like to think about my deals is in the sense of like, what cards do I have in my hand, right? Mm -hmm. Like what cards can I play? And you better believe before I lose a deal, I'm going to play every single card I have. Mm -hmm. And if you play all of your cards and you play your best hand and you lose there, there, there really is no frustration afterwards. Right. Cause it's like, you know, that you did all that you could. It's those moments of frustration when you kind of like look back and like realize what you could have done better or like other cards that you could have played. So to your point being that you are and were at the time a content creator were were very public right with creating content and building community i'm sure there were opportunities even beyond a partnership right like be be on your posts right like talk about 
some of the awesome things that Blake, you know, talk to the people on the team about some of the awesome things that Blake is doing. So to your point that that just adds an additional element um, of kind of opportunity that wasn't necessarily taken advantage of. I like that. Yeah. I, um, again, now thinking back on it, I, one of the things that I, I would say Julie was missing was she treated this like another sale although there were parts in this sales process that were different. First of all, having such a strong, ardent internal champion, that's different than most of your sales, I would imagine. I wasn't just a content creator. I was specifically talking to other sales leaders. Coaching was a big part of what I talked about. And so it didn't have to be this formal partnership with the company and I'm getting paid to do sponsor posts. I could have helped that specific AEO. We could have done a quick little series. We could have done a five-part video series on why this is beneficial, not just the software, but the solution. They're, they're never, I, I put those sorts of breadcrumbs out there. There was never anything more than that. And I think that's the real miss is because it could have not only solved this sale, process it could have actually created new opportunities as well um but hey that wasn't my responsibility so i didn't and there was nothing i could really do to take that to the next level it's a great point too it's almost like the modern day referral in a way right it's always like oh you know always ask for referrals but it's like always find ways that like you can help someone you know like whether it furthers your cause or not right like to your point like make a series together um you know you're talking specifically to sales leaders who julie sells to right hey do you know anyone else in your network that you know has these same philosophies as you like there's so many different ways that you can go and largely speaking like no two deals are exactly the same right, right. there will be some scattered similarities throughout but like you're selling to the humans at those companies right and all mm -hmm. humans are different so I, I i really like this kind of creative um deal progression uh that you're talking about right or just like helping someone even if it has nothing to do with your deal right like just right. just being someone of value right like we and in, in our nature like want to reciprocate and you know you have someone that's clearly putting in effort again to talk to sales leaders to like build this community so that is actually a huge opportunity that could have been there one, one thing that i kind of thought to myself too is again the decision maker never made it into a demo do you think something like julie recording a small snippet of a demo right you know what i mean or like some sort of video message that again you could have been a conduit for like do you think that had a chance to push the needle forward at all? Was it deeper stuff I'm, than that? Or I'm telling you, the demo thing was not the issue. There, there was one of the things that was positive from the decision maker side of things. There was an understanding of what the software was. So it wasn't a situation where it was like completely in the dark. What is this thing, Blake, that you're trying to do? What, what, what are you talking about? Game of it was clearly understood, like, this is what it is, this is what it does. And the people who would have to implement it, most importantly, they think that it's something that would be helpful and they could see themselves implementing. The problem was the urgency, was this priority? Could this be something that we put on our roadmap? And um, yeah, the, the frustration for me was that all the other tools that seemed to be prioritized were things that had not been really... Uh, including me in that conversation. So it was kind of like I'd been given these things and like, here, this will help you. Well, here, this should help you. And it's like, what about the thing that I said would help me when you were interviewing me? So that was the issue there was the lack of urgency, not the lack of information. If anything, there might've been too much information, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is neither here nor there. This is water under the bridge. Sounds like it could have been some leadership issues too, but. Mm -hmm do have one important question for you for all our folks that are still hanging with us. We appreciate you. This is a lot to unpack here uh, and right. a lot of valuable learning lessons. I mean, you always say like you learn more from the lost deals than the one deals. So I'm so glad that we got to do this for, for the folks that are still with us. 
what would be the one big takeaway, right, that you'd give from this episode, from this story for folks to take into their daily roles, right, and and genuinely get better at their job, right, from learning through these experiences? What would you say to that? The customers have the answers to the test, but you have to ask the right questions. And I don't think that the right questions were asked about that sales process. So it kind of became this just feeling around in the darkness, trying to understand why this deal wasn't progressing. Well, if you, you poke around a little bit, you go a little bit deeper, you realize this is not like many or any other sales uh, processes that I've had, if I were putting myself in their shoes. Um, so what are the factors then that are different? How do I uncover those? How do I use those as levers to move things forward? Um, something else I see reps fall into is they see the sales process as a race. And it's more of a maze. You need to be able to understand how to go about navigating the sales process with the buyer leading the way, right? They will show you the way that they want to be sold to, but you have to be willing to like, listen, you have to be willing to see that. If you're so caught up in moving them through your sales process at your sales pace, you're going to miss out on opportunities. Um, and I'll be honest, sometimes I, I like, I do miss being an AE because some of those concepts seem so obvious to me now and in ways that they didn't always when I was in the individual contributor role. But um, yeah, th those would be my two takeaways that um, sales is not a race, it's it's a maze and that the, the customer has the answers to the test. You just have to ask the right question. Both of those are for sure getting turned into sound clips. That was so good. As you know, I'm a huge analogy guy. So I'm like bubbling over here. Unfortunately, we're running out of time and I want to make sure that you have time to plug. So tell us, Blake, what are you up to? You got a lot on your plate. You got a course, self-esteem mm -hmm. as a service. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the course was something that was born out of my own challenge. I'm a big advocate for helping where you've hurt. Um, I ex to experience layoffs and, you know, I didn't want to just lament or wallow in my own pain. I, despite having gone through that, was also really well-versed in interviews. I had probably been about 250 of them in 2022, hired 20 plus people and coached, you know, over a hundred others in, in their interview prep. So it was like, how do I distill this information and give it to people in a very tight and compacted way? So that's what the course was. It's called Story Selling. It's five different modules. Um, basically, we help folks reframe their interview mindset, understanding that they are the solution uh, to this company's problem. Then we look at persuasion, the art of persuasion. We even go back to Aristotle's rhetorical appeals. Then we look at the what makes for a story and how do you go about crafting yours by pulling from these various aspects of your life. I use the metaphor of like your grocery shopping and you pull these little items off the shelves. These are little vignettes of your life, but what do you need to pull off the shelf to make this meal? You know, helping people walk through that exercise was helpful. Fourth module was um, using some of my concepts that I learned from my career in politics and higher education, academia, to be able to communicate effectively. And then the last module was about building an interview cheat sheet and going into it with the game plan and being as prepared as possible. So that's the course. If you're interested, it's the links on my LinkedIn profile. Um, these days, I, I mean, I'm really talking about three things that are important to me. And I'm, you know, the more I dive in on them, the more I'm realizing it's important in the sales process. There's three words that all begin with C. That's confidence, curiosity, and communication. So you need confidence. And this is for me, I'm I'm trying to live in this intersection between personal development and sales. You need confidence just to, to get started, to make the cold call, to start prospecting, to start outbounding. You need curiosity when you go through that discovery phase to really understand what the prospect's looking for, what their pain points are. And you you can't fake that curiosity. So if you're asking stale questions, you're gonna get stale answers. The last thing is communication. So how do you go about leveraging effective communication strategies to go through negotiation, to pull in various stakeholders? Um, so those are the topics that are important to me. And I think they have implications both for your personal and professional lives as salespeople. Um, that's that's about me. Uh, I don't have too, too much plugging to do. Hopefully that I said something in this interview that, you know, resonated with you and you check me out more. But if not, you know, that's okay too. What an ending.
Blake Hudson, go connect with him on LinkedIn. Go check out his story selling course that is on your LinkedIn. Um, we'll put a uh, we'll, we'll put a link here uh, in the comment or the uh, or the caption of the episode as well. Blake, this has been amazing. First episode of its kind. Definitely, definitely, definitely want to do more because I think there's so much to learn from those deals that get so close and we just don't get there. So again, thank you for reliving through that very frustrating experience, your incredible storytelling skills. Sales Stories in Real Life fam, we'll see you next week. Cheers.